Most fantasy takes place in a quasi-historical setting. They are inspired by history. Yet there are things about pen and paper that seem pretty weird when viewed from a historical point of view. You would even simply call them wrong as far as anything can really be wrong in fantasy. Why is that so? My guess is that the creators either don't care or they don't know any better. Since I think the only reason to deviate from historical reality is to make it even cooler, there is really no excuse for not knowing any better. So this is So Now You Know. Hey folks, this is Grim Perspectives, I'm Grim. Today I'd like to talk to you about armor. You know it from movies like The Lord of the Rings or Braveheart. You know it from TV series like Vikings or Game of Thrones. You know it from video games and you know it from fantasy illustrations and it ranges from good cool adaptations of historical designs to what the fuck moments like that well that's more suited to a fetish shop than anything that should really be armor and if you look at historical sources you see things like this or like this. And the difference is quite stark. And li I'd like to talk to you a bit about those differences and where they come from. Hey folks, um, as you can see now, this is actually the reason I wanted to talk about armor today. Because I'm heading towards a live action role playing convention this weekend, and I'm gonna play be playing my squire. And since I've got the whole kit down here, I might as well talk about it. And I think there are some things that I want to talk about today that might be important to understanding armor in a historical context and maybe in a fantasy context as well. And what I want to talk about today specifically is high priority locations for armoring a warrior. So, um, if you compare the TV series and movies and how armor is portrayed there. You see, there are some really cool armor designs. I mean, her armor is mostly rubber, but it looks really cool. Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones, but you knew that. Um, and if you compare it to historical sources, you might find something interesting. Here you see uh, some guys looting a building and there are some clear differences if you look at locations and how and when they are armored if you look at the historical example all of them are wearing helmets most of them are wearing something across their torso and why is that well let's make that an example Ah, uh, let's just grab a handy blunt object, something like this. This is a bokken, that's a pound of wood. Now, remember, uh, imagine I were to hit you with it, full force. Where, if you had to take it, where did you want it, would you want to take that blow? And where would you not want to take that blow? That's just wood. But a blow to the head with force will still kill you. So the first thing you armor is your noggin. Put something on your head. And in this case, my helmet. I'm just not gonna have it on all the time because, well, uh, it sounds funny if you're talking it. But now if someone hits me on the head, it might make a terrible ding. I can actually do something about that. That's my negligence. I could have uh, sewn in the liner and that would be no problem there. But it doesn't hurt me. And a hit to the head is likely to kill you. So if someone goes out and even if he is just a peasant and if he, even if he can only just afford well, one piece of gear, one piece of armor, he would most likely armor his head. So... What's the next likely thing to kill you? Well, a hit to the arms or legs would break a bone, yeah, but that's unlikely to kill you outright. And um, the next thing that is usually armored in a historical context is your torso. But it's not because of blunt weapons. 
if you look at the difference between your head and your torso, that here is pretty hard. That's because your skull is bone. There's literally, there's only skin, bit of tissue, and then there's bone. So any blunt force might shatter your skull. On the other hand, your torso is, even if you're trained as fuck, <laughs> is pretty soft when compared to your head. And because of that, it can take blunt force quite well, well, compared to your head, without permanent damage or at least without killing you outright. But since it is pretty soft, it can get stabbed pretty easily. And that's why if you have still money or, well, <laughs> carrying capacity, so to speak, to spare, the next thing you armor after you've covered your head is your torso. And there are different things you can do there. Uh, what I've done here is underneath all of that, I am wearing a gambeson, a uh, akaton. Uh, that's uh, actually, that, that here is more like an arming doublet. But all of those things actually mean that you have fabric, sometimes with padding between it. This here is uh, two layers of tough fabric with a linen um, inside, so it's nice to wear. And in between that is padding and more padding at the places I need more padding. So, um, what does that do? Well, it's pretty cut resistant and it's p pretty stabbing resistant. I might do a video about leather armor and uh, fabric armor in the future to get further into that, but at the moment that's a bit of protection. But at my torso to protect it better, I'm also wearing this here. That might look like fabric as well, because it is fabric on the top. And between that are um, pieces of metal, in this case, mild steel. Um, and that's what you might call a brigandine or a check of plates. But anyway, my torso is protected. And what is left then? Well, the other parts of me aren't that well protected. My arms are just covered by gambeson. My feet and legs are covered by boots and hosen, but that's just one layer of wool that isn't gonna help you. Um, why is that? Well, they aren't that important. If you think about it, your arms, well, you might take a hit, but everything you will take on here has the advantage that if something hits you with force, your arm's gonna move out of the way on his own accord. Your torso will take much more of the force because it takes much more to get your torso moving backwards and it takes your arm and on the other hand your arm if it breaks yeah you're out of the fight you might die but if you can uh, get out of it you might as well survive so your arm isn't that important and it's harder to armor because you want to still have your flexibility you need to draw a sword you need to wield it do all kind of stuff and all of that gets pretty hard if you start adding plate, especially stiff armor parts to it. So you see a lot of shoulder and arm protection in illustrations and sometimes in movies and series, but um, that has more to do that it makes a nice silhouette for the character. You look really, really buff when you have like shoulder pads and everything. It's uh, like football armor in that instance. So it's more looking tough and less functional in that case. And you really want to move your arms. What you want to move as well are your legs. And that's why I'm not really wearing armor there. My gambeson goes down there to well above the knee. But um, yeah, your legs protect you because you move out of the way of blows. You run away if you need to and pretty much everything you do in combat depends on your legs it's where all your force has its source because you take it from the ground and you put it into all those motions you need and uh, so yeah arms are not that important legs are uh, shoulders are not that important 
and they are easy to uh, they are hard to armor because you might face problems with m mobility there and your legs are equally hard to armor and well if you break a leg you can survive it yeah um if that's the function of armor why doesn't hollywood and tv series and stuff use it in the same way well, uh, the silhouetting part is one thing, you want to look your character a certain way, like broad in the shoulder, and therefore there's a focus on shoulder padding and stuff like that. The other thing is, why they aren't wearing helmets in specific, uh, specifically, is that you need to see an actor's face. It's what he works with. It's how he portrays emotion, how we recognize that it's him, and that's why you usually see characters in series and in movies not wearing helmets when they actually should but well that's the thing about adapting from different media if we have an idea and it comes from hollywood they have a specific rule set of how they work they've got circumstances and we if we adapt it to another setting like live action role playing like uh, pen and paper we might need to think about it if that's still correct because in a pen and paper context is it still so that uh, you need to recognize that that man well um, in medieval times people didn't have Facebook and they didn't have uh, print media that had pictures of people in them so you recognize someone not from his face but because of his livery because of his heraldry so the colors he wore his uh, insignia his shields uh, in later times his rank and the uniform he wore so you knew who that was or his station by what he wore and arm was a big part of that and that's why i think it's important that we well talk about if we want armor to look and work like it does in uh, hollywood or if we want to take a step in the other direction and make it work more like it did in historical times. So, well, we are going to talk a bit more in depth about uh, what that might mean for pen and paper rules, but that's a far for another video. Um, so far, armor, quick overview. What to armor, what isn't that important to armor? Until next time, Grim out.